Hey everybody, Comfy Seat Kyle here with uh, Beyond the Book Book Reviews. And I found, it. well I didn't really find a great book. I actually have had this book for a long time and I just, this is a great book. This is Johnny Tremaine by Esther Forbes. Oops, that's my quote. And um, this is a Newbery uh, Award uh, Newbery Award winner in the children's division, but I don't really agree with that. I think it should be in the adult division, well, teen division, if there is one, um, because this is not, I don't think this is for little kids. They wouldn't really understand it. I think this would be more for older kids that know what the Boston Revolution is and the Revolutionary War. And uh, this is a very great book. It ha it brings in many perspectives. It brings in what the, um, what the actual victims think it uh the people in boston and the rebel uh, the rebellious which the um the revolutionaries and all the great men samuel adams and all those other ones george washington uh it brings it in here and well it's not george washington it just talks about george washington a little bit and so um it also brings in the the views, the perspective of the British soldiers. It uh, it brings them in and it talks with them. Well, that's the storks on the beach. We're in winter. Yay! Um, those aren't storks, though. I don't know what they are. Um, but it also brings in their views. So it gives both sides. You really understand the story better. This is about a uh, the boy named Johnny Tremaine. He uh, he was an apprentice of a silversmith. So he but he had a great future ahead of him. He was going to become a great silversmith. He already was at that point. He was the master of his house. His master was too old to really do anything. He sat down, read the Bible, read the Bible to every to his entire family, and um, sometimes napped in the yard with the basket over his head and sometimes he made plans but he was really too old like to make plans with his customers for silver and so Johnny did most of that for him he took down all the dates he did he made most of the silver um, and he did all that he was he and he was marrying the master's daughter and so he had a pretty good future ahead of him but then it all ended when one day a rich uh, buyer of the master the silversmith uh, came in and he requested a really fancy uh, thing of silver by a certain date. Uh, of course, the master didn't write it down, but Johnny did, since he did all that. And um, it came close to the date when that was going to be needed. Uh, it hadn't been started. The master had been ignorant. Oh, we'll, we'll do it tomorrow. Oh, we'll do it tomorrow the next day. Oh, we'll do it tomorrow the next day. And so then finally, the day, no, the two days before it, would, it was needed, it was a Saturday, and so he got to work on it with, uh, and he just worked and worked and worked on it because this was how he was going to get ahead. This is his, this was his chance and the entire family's chance. And he worked all Saturday and late into the night until Sunday until like one in the morning but he stopped right before it became sunday so at like almost 12 and then early that morning the wife said uh he's going the master's going to church i need this money from this silver to go to feed my children and myself and the entire family and so she said we we you need to do this and so she said work on sunday i don't care just do, get it done and so he went and he um and he worked on the silver, he did it, and then it, he had the silver, he had the molding, like the wax molding of what it was happening. And so then all he needed to do was to dip the the wax, the actual thing, in the silver, and so then it was coated in silver. And so um, Dove, he was another apprentice, he was less skilled, he was very jealous of Johnny. He, um, he grabbed a cracked tool, I don't know what it was for, I don't really know anything about silversmithing. He grabbed a cracked tool, tool that he knew the silver would leak out of, and then Johnny would get um, in trouble, and then he would get the upper hand, so he just had this whole plot. And so he gave Johnny the broken, like, cast or something, and um, he gave him the broken cast, and then Johnny put the silver in there, he was, like, about to do it, and then all the silver spilled out. And he tried to stop it, and he was, wasn't really thinking because he had to stop it really fast, so he... Uh, so he like went to lunge to grab it and stop the silver, but then he tripped and placed his hand like this. I don't know exactly how he did it, but he placed it somehow like somewhat like this. Helicopter and a jet. Come on, speed up. 
he placed his hand on the silver and he burnt his hands together with the silver and so all his fingers were deformed they were all melted together and so after that his life was for the next several months his life was a wreck he couldn't do any silversmithing that his apprenticeship was destroyed but the family was nice enough to let him stay and eat with them after that he tries he tried to start looking for a job he was he was getting more um he was becoming he was becoming rebellious he wasn't doing the things he was supposed to he uh he was about to go become a thief when finally he started looking for jobs and he met somebody, uh, the uh, apprentice. He was the nephew of the owner, that uh, the owner of the um, of the newspaper shop, and he was really nice. He listened to his story. He was the first person that Johnny had told his story to. His name is Rob, and it had just happened that the owner of this. Uh, newspaper was in like a private circle of the um of all the greats in the revolutionary war um just all of those the rebellious and so they so all the meetings were hosted in the newspaper shop up in the attic and so johnny uh finally got the job there and he just rode the newspapers all around the city delivering it and so he was so he knew about this and he became like a key uh a key inside this operation and so he would like give out certain codes to like the certain people that were in here there was paul revere samuel adams john hancock john adams just all those ones and actually they actually helped him a lot and so he helped in the boston tea party all that and um and so then one night there was a secret meeting. This is after the Boston Tea Party. Um, and this is a quote, well, a speech that Samuel Adams uh, gave. But I'm going to give two quotes. The first one is Samuel Adams. And then the second one is somebody called... Um, is somebody called James Otis. He was the founder of the secret circle of rebellious people. And but he he had passed his like helpful age in the circle. He was old and he wasn't he was like going like he was just old and he couldn't handle himself very well. And so they didn't invite him to any of the meetings anymore. And so uh, so that's so he gives the second quote which explains the first quote and why we need to do this so this is Samuel Adams peace peace there is no peace but I will in Philadelphia play a cautious part not throw all my cards on the table oh no but nevertheless I will work for one thing war bloody and terrible death and destruction but out of it shall come such a country as was never seen before on this earth we will fight and then uh, James Otis comes in and interrupts it and um, helicopter same helicopter that's not enough reason for going into a war did any occupied city ever have a better treatment than we've had from the British has one rebellious newspaper been stopped one treasonable speech where are the firing squads the jails jammed with political prisoners what about the gall gallows for you Sam Adams and for you John Hancock it has never been set up I hate those infernal British troops spread all over my town as much as you do can't move these days much without stepping on a soldier but we are not going off into a civil war merely to get them out of Boston. Why are we going to fight? Why? Why? Um, then uh, Sam says, we will fight for the rights of the Americans. England cannot take uh, money, our money away by taxes. Then uh, James, no, no, for something more important than pocketbooks of our American soldiers. Then Rab, uh, the nephew, says, for the rights of Englishmen everywhere. Why stop with English? Um, and Otis said Otis was, uh, and he was warming up. He had a what? Uh, for men and children all over the world, he said. So that's only part of the quote. If you want to get the rest of this inspirational quote and the other one, go get the book because it's such a great book. That's your. Uh, that's your motivation. Go get the book. Read it. Uh, study through it, write notes in it, I've written notes in this one, and just really soak in this book. This is an amazing book. Uh, it teaches a lot. It teaches that we can't do something, do anything. There's no purpose for doing anything without a reason. Make sure it's a good reason. Go find a reason. Create a reason. I don't care. Just do good in the world and uh, do everything you do for the good and that's your reason so that's that's the lesson in this book and 
this teaches, yeah, it's just, it's a great history book. It teaches all about, uh, the, uh, the Boston, uh, uh, revolt and the Tea Party and all of that. And it teaches a lot about the great men who were behind this. And so, this is just a great book. Go get it. And that's what I think about this. So, see you later. Thanks for watching.